What is the creepiest glitch in the matrix you've experienced? Like and subscribe or I'll haunt you tonight. A little backstory, I was a total idealist back in high school, so when choosing a college, I chose to go somewhere that none of my friends were attending so that I could strike out on my own in a finding myself sort of way. Well, I ended up making a few really close friends my first semester. I mean, these guys became like family to me in a matter of months. One day during winter break, one of those guys, my buddy Kimbo, had gone back home to visit friends and family, and on his return trip to our college, he hit a bad patch of ice and got into a car accident and was killed. It hurt so bad for a long time and I still think about him all the time. But anyways, a few weeks after Kimbo's accident, me and the rest of the guys were getting back from a party off campus, and as we were standing outside our dorm building smoking a cig, I felt my phone vibrating, and when I pulled it out, I saw that I was getting a call from Kimbo's phone. Dumbfounded, I showed my friends the phone quickly and then answered. When I picked up, it just went directly to his voicemail which played the same message it always had. It never happened again and we never really talked about it, but for me, it was one of those someone's looking after me moments. I hadn't been doing very well after his death, but seeing his name show up on my cell phone screen one final time made me feel a whole lot better for a time and really helped me get out of the slump I was in. I have no idea how his phone could have possibly called me and I doubt I ever will, but this was one glitch in the matrix that I'll forever be thankful for. Rest in peace Kim, but feel free to call again. Setting, acid trip when I was 25 or so, at this really cool music festival called Rustler's Valley, in the mountains in the east of South Africa. So at the time, I was taking a fair amount of acid, really enjoying what it did to my mind, but not really enjoying the actual trips at all. Mentally, they were really hard work. I eventually figured out acid was not very good for me personally. Anyway, early that night, going up, I was sitting somewhere, with someone, on the ground next to one of the stages. At some point, I became aware of someone standing in front of me, looking at me. For some reason, it gave me the most extreme chills, and I couldn't look directly at this person at all. I wanted to get up and leave, but somehow that just felt like a completely wrong thing to do. The person eventually walked away, after what felt like a really long time. The night went its course after that, and like any old acid trip, turned out to be several successive trips between Hell and Valhalla. Much later, early morning hours, coming down, I walked around aimlessly, and got to this spot next to one of the stages, where I spotted someone wearing the same jeans as I did, which was kind of unlikely, because I used to make my own jeans from very bright and busy curtain fabric in those days. As I got closer, I realized it was me, from earlier that night. I stopped in front of myself, trying to figure out what to do with this bombshell and then noticed how uncomfortable I was making earlier me, and ended up just wandering off, completely freaked out. After that trip, I still took mushrooms quite often, they always agreed with me, but that was my last acid trip ever. I work as a security or nighttime attendant at an apartment building. It's 24 stories and one of the oldest buildings in the city. One night, I'm sitting here when the phone rings at about 3 AM, and I answer, hello. This is Draven at the front desk, how can I help you? The voice on the other end sounded female, but was totally garbled and the only bit I could make out was 23rd floor. I tried to tell the person I couldn't understand them, and asked what apartment they were in, but again garbled response and 23rd floor. After the third time of trying to understand them and the same response, I said since I couldn't understand them, I'd come up and to meet me in the hallway. So I go to the main elevators, and both are up on the 23rd floor. Luckily, we have an older service elevator and it's only on the 7th floor, so I call it down. I get it and hit the button for the 23rd floor, but it won't move and the inner door won't close, so I go to unlock the reset panel and boom we start going up, door still open. I'm freaking out, and the elevator is shaking because it goes pretty fast and is old. As I'm going up, I just stay towards the back and finally I reach floor 23. I step out, door closes just fine and I look around the hallway. There's nobody around. I walk along slowly trying to listen for anyone awake who might have called, but there's nothing. So now I head the opposite direction and go towards where the regular elevators are, and when I get to them, 
they are just sitting there with their doors open. I was pretty freaked out, but I knew it could just be the elevators on the fritz, so I get in and figure I'll just reset them when I get to floor 1 when I hear the sound of the back stairwell closing. So I quickly get out and go to the stairwell and lo and behold, no one's there, but the maintenance door to the machine room is ajar, and at that time, I'm the only one in the building with a key. At the top of the building is a large machine room housing all the really really loud machinery that does stuff in the building and allows access to the roof. I don't like going into it, because it's so creepy and no one ever goes there, so at this point, I'm seriously freaked out, but I muster up and head in. I shout, hello? And there's no response. The lights in this room flicker because they're shitty fluorescent, so I can't see well either, but at the end of the room, I can make out the roof access door and sure enough, it's slightly open. So I slowly continue forward checking the space in between each machine as I walk by, and there's no one there, so I open the roof access door. I can't see anyone ahead of me on the roof, but there is a slight wrap around and if there was a jumper or something I needed to be sure, so I step out and leave the door ajar like it was. Almost immediately, the door is pulled shut. Now I might have written it off as wind or something, but this door is hard to shut and hard to open, really hard. I immediately grab the handle and hank it open, slam it behind me and run straight for the maintenance door. It automatically locks when it's closed, so I slam it shut too and go back to the 23rd floor hallway, get into an elevator, doors still open, and go all the way down to the first floor. I go back to the main lobby, and as soon as I sit down, the phone rings. I pick it up, don't say a word, and sure as hell garbled voice again only audibly saying 23rd floor. I hung up the phone, turned the ringer off and spent the rest of the evening just staring at the parking garage security monitor. There's been a bunch of creepy things happen at this building, it's basically like the Overlook Hotel at night. I walked past a dark room here on the first floor once and swore I saw myself standing inside it. The next night as I'm inside said room cleaning, the lights flip off and I turn around to see a quick flash of myself walking past. Me and my friend were at a Chinese restaurant and we ordered a general tso chicken dinner and a shrimp lo mein dish. When we sat down we took out both boxes and set them on the table about two feet apart. My friend opens the first box and we see a shrimp lo mein dish. It has all the things in there, noodles, shrimp, fried rice. He closes the box and opens the other box. Inside that box is another shrimp lo mein dish, shrimp, noodles, fried rice. Oh, I think they must have mixed the order. I was just about to say this when my friend says out loud, looks like they made a mistake and gave us two. As he opens up the first box again, inside of it is a General Tso chicken dinner order. General Tso chicken, white rice, and an egg roll. He froze and looked at me, I looked back at him, and we sat in silence. It took us five or so minutes to collect ourselves. I have no idea what just happened. I had just turned 22 and my parents had sold their house and purchased a place out in the country. On the property there was a big shed not far from the house that I decided to turn into my place, now I felt kind of uncomfortable in the shed sometimes, but my dog kept me company, so it wasn't so bad. Anyway, I had been in there maybe two weeks, and one night, I'm on the computer, my dog asleep at my feet and I need to pee, so I get up and go outside to piss. It's a beautiful clear night and the stars were incredible. Next thing I hear the shed door slam behind me. I turn immediately and try to open it, but it won't budge. Now from inside the shed, I can hear my dog start to growl, quietly at first then louder, now he's barking and I'm panicking trying to get the door open. I must mention that I'm 6 foot 5 and well built, play sports etc, but even ramming my full weight into the door won't open it, and I'm really panicking now as my dog's barks turned into whines, then whimpering, then silence, and with all my might, I slam into the door and it flies open. The light is off inside now and it's pitch black, it won't turn back on and I'm in complete darkness. Can't see my dog anywhere and I stumble around trying to find a torch. Finally I find it and pick it up and turn on my torch, and I wasn't prepared for what I'd see next. My dog had literally squashed itself into the furthest darkest corner of the room, eyes closed, and is shaking violently. I immediately moved towards him, and as soon as I got within reach of him, he leapt at me into my arms and wouldn't move. I picked him up and I swear I've never ran so fast in my goddamn life. I never stepped foot in that shed ever again, 
and my dog wouldn't even go near that part of the property. I don't know what happened in that shed that night, but I'll never forget it. About a year ago, my girlfriend and I went to eat dinner at Chipotle's. It's in a smallish shopping area with a burger joint and pay way neighboring the Chipotle, one of those kind of upper classy type shopping areas. We pulled into the parking lot in front of the establishments at around 5 p.m. on a Friday evening to find an empty parking lot. There were no tables outside, there were no cars in the parking spots, not a person in sight and even the lights inside the buildings were off. Completely confused, I took the car in a sort of loop around the building in order to leave. The only thing of interest was a single fire truck parked alongside the building, headlights on, but no emergency lights, and no one in the truck. It struck us a little odd, maybe a fire in the building? As we pull around the backside of the building, and then finish looping around, we drive past the front facade of the building. Except this time every parking spot is full, tables are outside with patrons at them, food half eaten. There's people walking around, and the lights inside the buildings are all on, but the fire truck was gone. Mind you, it took less than 30 seconds to make a circle around the building. Easily one of the strangest things I've ever experienced, more adjustment bureau than matrix glitchy. I am from Finland, and that's also where these things I'm about to describe to you happened. This was some years ago, pre-smartphone or GPS era. It was the end of the summer, and myself and two friends were on a camping trip way up in the north, in Lapland. The mosquito season was over, and the weather was cooling down in anticipation of the coming fall. The three of us had packed food and gear for a 10-day trek. The car we arrived in had been left at the parking lot of a visitor center, this happened within the premises of the Urho Kekkonen National Park, a 985-square-mile stretch of wilderness near the Russian border. The terrain there varies greatly, from treeless and semi-mountainous to dense forest of spruce and pine and dwarf birch. There are lots of swamps, seeing reindeer is not uncommon and some nights you might hear wolves in the distance. You can run into a bear or a wolverine in this place, but of course normally they avoid people. We mostly camped in a tent, but some nights, we used shelters and simple huts provided for travelers free of charge. The trip had lasted five days, we were at the furthest of any kind of civilization we were going to be on that particular outing, truly in the middle of nowhere, there really is nothing there. There are no villages, towns or industry, the place is a national park after all. Seeing other hikers happen from time to time, you'd see some people in the distance maybe, very rarely would you come face to face with anyone. So, in the middle of our trip, we were camped in a small clearing, woodland extending around us for a considerable distance in all directions. It was already dark, we had eaten our evening meal and all three of us were jammed in our only tent. It was a bit cramped, but we fit. We took turns carrying it during the hikes. We were just exchanging some jokes and crude humor in the dark, like guys in their 20s do, about to go to sleep in our sleeping bags. When we quieted down, we began to hear it, talking, and the sound of machinery. Given our location, this was profoundly weird. We camped in a tent because there were no huts nearby. Maybe there was another camp somewhere near us? We couldn't quite make out what was being said, but it was a human voice, no doubt about it. But nothing really could explain the sound of heavy machinery. It sounded like an excavator or a tank, something big, powerful, and really not too far away. Combined with the sound of talking, we thought construction yard. But at that time of night, in an unpopulated, protected nature reserve? We got out of our tent. It was cold and pitch black, the campfire had some coals still glowing. We took out our flashlights. My two buddies have always been a lot braver than me. The sound was clearly coming from the north, maybe half a kilometer away. We thought the construction might be going on behind a small hill some distance away. We could see no lights or anything. We still could not make out what was being said. The speaking like voice was monotonous, and it was impossible even to say what language was being used. Still sounded a lot like a person speaking though. You may be aware of the sort of spooky phenomenon of hearing a human voice in static. Maybe you've used a blow dryer and been sure someone is talking, turn it off and it was just something the brain tried to interpret from the steady hum. Maybe it was sort of like that, it's hard to explain. The machinery-like sound continued, not loud, but you could sort of make out the powerful engine, at times accelerating or adding power, at times at idle. 
my two friends resolved to go find out what was going on. We put our warm clothes back on, donned boots and I sat next to the dying fire, adding some more wood to it. I would stay at camp while my buddies left to check out this mystery construction yard in the middle of nowhere in the Lapland woods. So, there I sat, the guys took out their maps, took a compass heading and left and I could hear them make their way through the forest, see the light from their flashlights. Then, they were gone, the weird sounds continued, unaltered. They were gone 15 minutes, then maybe 30. Then the better part of an hour. It was odd, judging by the volume of the sound, they should have reached it, checked it out and been back already. I added more firewood, and tried to make out what the person talking was saying, but it was too tinny and obscure. The guys had been away for over two hours. I figured they had stayed for coffee with the construction guys or something. Then the sound stopped, just like that, it just ended, all at the same time. The engine sound and the voice both just quit, it was very silent. I waited for another 30 minutes, very worried now that something had happened, that maybe my friends were lost. Should I go and try to find them? I shouted their names several times, and built the fire pretty big. I was scared shitless when suddenly I saw the flashlights of my friends. Apparently, they were returning in a hurry. The guys got back to camp, out of breath. They told me the following, they had followed the sound beyond the small ridge in the distance. There was nothing there, and it seemed like they were not getting any closer to the source of the sounds. They had to stop every now and then, be quiet and listen to it to be able to walk towards it. They walked and stopped like this for some time, then realized they were not getting any closer. The sounds did not change in volume at all. They decided to go just a bit further several times, when suddenly the sound just stopped like someone pressed a button on a recording. They realized they had been going on for a long time. They were in the middle of the dark woods, alone. They reversed the heading and started back at a brisk pace. Eventually, they saw my big ass fire from the top of a hill and found their way back. The weird thing is, we seem to think the sound stopped at different times. They had been gone two and a half hours in total. They said the sound stopped at around the one hour 15 minutes mark after they left, they then started to head back immediately, return trip taking a bit longer even though they kept a good pace, they apparently wandered around a bit. For me, the sound stopped at the two hour mark, just 30 minutes before they returned. We did not sleep that night. Nothing more happened on that trip, and we never found out what the weird construction yard-like sound was about. When we returned to the park's visitor center some five days later, we asked around but no one knew of any ongoing construction taking place in the whole national park area. Been bugging me ever since. In about 2003 or 2004, my mother, who is absolutely not a believer in ghosts or glitches in matrices etc., and would never exaggerate a story, told me about a dream she had which I have never forgotten. She said she had dreamt about an old family friend who was dying of lung cancer. In her dream, she was hanging out the washing on the clothesline in our backyard, when suddenly, he walked through the trees and called out to her. She noticed he was wearing a pilot uniform. She was shocked to see him looking so well, and exclaimed, Oh my God, you look well, why are you here? Come and talk to me. He answered, Sorry, no. I've only come to say goodbye to you, and to tell you I'm so much better, but I can't stay, I've got to go now, goodbye. And off he walked, past her, through the yard and out of sight. For some reason, my mother woke up, rolled over and looked at the time, 5.23 am. Later that day, she got a phone call from his wife, he had passed away at that exact time. I've stopped telling people this story as no one ever believed me. I'll never forget it, it's been driving me crazy for 30 years, I'm sorry for the length of this. When I was a kid in England, in primary school, around 1987-ish, a new kid joined the school on a temporary basis for a term. He had an American accent and was ginger, his name was Lee. Before he left us, he brought into school what today would look sort of like a tablet computer, but this was very thin with brown tan glass. He had cartoons on it, he totally loved cartoons and movies. I swear this happened, I didn't dream it. It was amazing, there was a crowd of kids who saw it and their reaction was interesting, because they liked it and wanted one, comparing it to the Nintendo game and watch and calculators, but sort of accepted it and didn't think it was magical, but it certainly was. 
I said to him it was like the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy prop used in the TV series. He didn't know what I meant. He kept it away from the teachers and didn't bring it back in. I kept asking him questions about his calculator TV, and he just gave vague answers and saying he didn't know, but when I asked where he bought it, he said his dad got it from the US. One other thing he said, he saw a movie which had every cartoon character ever. A few years later, I realized he was talking about who framed Roger Rabbit which came out soon after. This was 30 years ago and you can imagine how difficult in all this time it's been to describe this thing as we haven't had ubiquitous tablets everywhere. I used to draw diagrams of it and show it to people. I went crazy when I saw the Tom Hanks movie Big, the scene where he pitches a handheld comic book video device, my parents just sort acknowledged it, just humoring me. When Star Trek TNG came out and the pad was shown on screen, I went that's it, that's the thing. Eventually, the tablet PC came out and I remember thinking finally at last, the video iPod was further confirmation. Today, it's obvious that it was a tablet computer, and my story sounds more convenient and BS. I suppose I could track some of the other kids down on Facebook to prove this, I bet they would remember. Naturally, no one believes me. A couple weeks ago, my friend's dad told me a pretty bizarre story that scarred me for life. About 15 years ago, my friend's parents, Steve and Julie, were woken up at 1 AM to a very loud thud that rattled the house. Worried that one of the kids had fallen out of the bunk bed, Steve went downstairs to check on them, but all three kids were sound asleep and safe in their beds. Julie told Steve to check the house in case of intruders, so Steve checked the doors and windows before going outside to take a look. After 10 minutes of investigating, the noise Steve came across nothing unusual and went back inside to go to bed. He found his wife absolutely worried sick and she demanded to know where the hell he had gone and what happened. Confused and tired, Steve told her he found nothing and tried to calm her down before Julie pointed out that it was now 4 AM and that he had been missing for 3 hours. Julie had even gone outside to check on him and he was nowhere to be found and didn't respond to her calling his name. Unable to figure out what happened, they returned to bed and slept until Steve had to get up for work in a few hours. Steve owns a painting business, and a couple hours after working on a house, he noticed his eyes started to feel itchy, then his eyes started to burn. Then after a couple hours, his eyes burned so badly that he was holding his eyelids open as to not blink, because it felt like his lids were sandpaper against his eyes. His employees rushed him to the hospital and Steve was treated for second-degree flash burns on his eyes. He was told his burns were equivalent to staring at a welder's torch without eye protection for an extended period of time. His eyes were treated and he was lucky to have his vision fully restored. He is one of the most stand-up guys I know, and the way he told the story gave me the creeps, dead serious and no explanation for what happened. His wife was there too and she was visibly upset when he was telling me that story.